Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and recently we were covering a bit of Mordheim lore, this is an extension to Warhammer Fantasy with the Carnival of Chaos. Now I've been on a pretty big Mordheim kick lately and there's loads of factions within Mordheim that we just don't know too much about. However, with the return of Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer the Old World at some point, you never know exactly when Games Workshop decide to drop it, we can look towards these factions and hope that they can return, and we're going to talk about one specific faction. Today we'll be turning our attention to the Empire. You see, within the lands of the Empire there are many orders that pretty much dominate, have their influence looming over others, and, well, they can cause quite a lot of trouble, depending on which way you look at it. We know of the many knightly orders within the Empire, we know of the churches, we know of the witch hunters, but there is also an order which acts very similar to a combining of the churches and the witch hunters. Today we'll be turning our attentions to the Sisters of Sigmar, which had a few names such as the Order of Merciful Sisters of Sigmar and also the Sisters of Mercy. Many people know them as the Battle Nuns of the Empire, the Sisterhood was known to have made Mordheim their home, and unfortunately, Mordheim as we know it did suffer a catastrophe which was a giant warpstone meteor, which pretty much decimated the city. Now in recent times, the Sisterhood hasn't really had a lot of lore, however, it is important to discuss as we will be going to a point in the timeline very soon with Warhammer the Old World, where things might be very close to each other. Let's start off by reading the entry to the Sisters of Sigma. For centuries, the nobility of the Empire has sent its wayward or troublesome daughters to the holy convent of the Order of the Merciful Sisters of Sigma in Mordheim to be initiated into the only order of priestesses dedicated to the Empire's patron god. The Sisters of Sigma, as they are commonly called, have traditionally traveled the Empire administrating to the sick and poor, tending to the needs of orphans, curing the diseased and mending broken bodies, as well as the healing arts which they practice with expert knowledge of herb law and prayer, their advice is frequently sought by those about to make an important decision, for the Sisters of Sigma are famed for their ability to predict the fickle course of fate. Though once much loved by the common people, the sisters have seen their popularity wane in recent years. Rabble-rousing witch hunters have denounced them as witches and heretics, so that even in the countryside they are attacked and driven away by the very peasants they seek to help. Many of Sigmar's priests wish to disband the order altogether, claiming that women have no right to teach the holy word of Sigmar. Even the Grand Theogenist, ostensibly the chief authority over the order, has cooled towards the sisterhood, denying the throne to Margrethe of Marienburg, who was brought up by the sisters and said to be sympathetic to their cause. These days the sisters of Sigmar have retreated to their convent situated high on the craggy island of Sigmar's Rock, in the River Stur in Mordheim. Of all the inhabitants of Mordheim, only the Sisters of Sigmar were prepared for its destruction. Ceres Cassandora foretold of the disaster, and at their nightly vigil, the Maidens of Sigmar heard the voice of Sigmar speaking in their dreaming minds. Thus, they knew that they would be safe in their fortress high above the city, raised as it is above the polluted vapors if only they were prepared to survive the fire of Sigmar's fury. While the rest of Mordheim fell under a spell of madness, the Sisters of Sigmar offered prayer after prayer, scourging themselves to drive out all thoughts of sin, fervently accepting a punishing penitential regime to harden their minds against the wantonness running rampant outside their walls. When the blow finally came, the Sisters gathered beneath the great temple dome of their convent, which, well built, and fortified as it was by the prayers of the sisters, protected them from the fire and heat of their master's ire. The sisters believe that they have a holy mission, a task that they have been set by Sigmar himself, and to which they must submit themselves body and soul. Their sacred duty is to gather up the shards of weirdstone and hide it deep beneath Sigmar's rock in the vaults of their convent, where, shielded by a great depth of solid granite, and guarded by the eternal prayers of the sisterhood, it will cause no harm to Sigmar's people. It is a nigh hopeless task, for there are 
are few sisters and countless shards of stone. Worse still, there are many who want to use the stone for themselves, to take it from Mordheim and spread its contagion amongst the cities of the Empire. The warbands of the Sisterhood are led by tough matriarchs, each accompanied by a body of warrior sisters. The training and harsh discipline of the convent includes mastery over martial as well as ecclesiastic skills, for mastery of the body is but the first steps towards the mastery of the soul. Their favoured weapon is the Warhammer, the instrument of Sigmar, seen as his holy symbol alongside the twin tail comet. So that's pretty much the majority of the lore when it comes to the Sisters of Sigmar itself, and what we do know is that they're not really trusted throughout the Empire by pretty much anyone at this point, barring themselves, and possibly a few locals here and there who will still favour the Sisters, knowing full well how much they've done for the people of Mordheim. Now, we didn't really get too much information regarding the Sisterhood fully. Uh, we know, obviously, of some units, but even then, this warband was quite small, where you can see some examples of miniatures on screen right now. There is some information regarding each of the units, a small bit of fluff here and there, so let's discuss that. First up, we have the Sigmarite Matriarch. There can only be one per warband. The Sigmarite Matriarchs, of whom there is an inner circle of 12, are answerable to the High Matriarch of the Temple. Each must lead a warband of sisters in frequent searches of the city in order to purge the ruins. Matriarchs are driven by zealous devotion to the cult of Sigmar and a relentless determination to redeem the sisterhood in his eyes. So we know that there is a high matriarch and then just 12 matriarchs. These are the leaders of the order themselves. So given that we know that there's 12 Sigmarite matriarchs, there would be 12 warbands and warbands generally don't get too large. So so yeah, you can have a decent amount, but don't expect this order to be extremely large, uh, more or less around maybe a knightly order, but not comparable to a uh, brotherhood within churches, for example. Next, we have the Sister Superior. Each of the Sisters Superior is a long-serving priestess of the Cult of Sigma, well-versed in the rituals of the temple and an example to the younger sisters and novices. The Sisters Superior are entrusted with maintaining the faith and fervor of the order. Any peril or foe that may lurk in the ruins of Mordheim is nothing compared to the wrath of a Sister Superior. So again, this is one of your heavy hitters. Now, all of the sisters within the Sisters of Sigmar would be terrifying in their own right, even the basic novices, but these ones would be the ones with the bigger hammers, essentially. Next, we have the Augur. The blind Augurs of the Sisterhood are blessed beyond their comrades. By giving up their sight, they have gained something far more. Second sight, a gift from their patron god. Only a very few are marked this way, and they are greatly revered by the Sisterhood. Unlike the rest of the priestess, they shave their heads, save for a single long braid. So the interesting part about this is that they do have blessed sight, whereas many people will see them as witches, heretics, and even not even part of the cult of Sigmar. It is very obvious that they still get blessings from their patron deity. Next, we have the Sigmarite Sister. Sigmarite Sisters know that their entire order is shamed in the eyes of their Lord Sigmar. Every one of them is sworn upon his altar to pacify the city and thereby redeem themselves. Whatever the perils and the horrors that stand in their way, they will be overcome. Not too much to talk about here as uh, they are the bog standard frontline Sigmarite Sisters. These are the ones that uh, would be the most common of the battle nuns. And finally, we have the novices. By tradition, the sisters draw their recruits only from the most noble houses of the empire, and families consider it a great honor to have their daughter accepted into the order. Only maidens of noble lineage can be relied upon to have the devotion to duty and innate sense of honor. Few though the recruits may be, they must endure several years as novices, during which time their devotion will be tested to the full. All are eager to prove themselves worthy to be the handmaidens of Sigmar. So, novices are quite an interesting thing to talk about, because obviously we know that the Empire is finding them less and less trustworthy, obviously because the Church and the Witch Hunters are trying to discredit them, but this makes me wonder how they're still being able to draw recruits. 
Though I imagine that there are still noble houses that cannot be swayed by the church or the witch hunters and are still able to fund the sisterhood every now and then, if not at least in secret. The sisters were themselves very unique. We didn't really have women-only orders in Warhammer Fantasy at that point. Obviously this would have been the Warhammer Fantasy version of the Sisters of Battle for example and naturally how Warhammer Fantasy was much smaller scale compared to 40k you wouldn't really be expecting full armies of the Sisterhood which is a massive shame. I would see myself running a full contingent or two of them uh, if they ever came back to, you know, one of the old world. And there's reasons to believe we might see them. Before we move on, however, it is important to note that the sisters didn't really receive that much lore. They had a few bits here and there due to Mordheim, and there was a novel that followed around a Sister of Sigmar, but that's pretty much it. They kind of faded into obscurity when Mordheim became a discontinued product. Thankfully, the fan base actually did continue Mordheim, and it still continues to this day through sites like Broheim, for example. But officially, it's one of these things where, um, yeah, it's been dead for a while. Now, it might be interesting to note that the Sisterhood of Sigmar were not completely eradicated post Mordheim. So, very recently, there have been mentions of them in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which is more or less linked to the 8th edition timeline, the timeline that you play in Total War Warhammer, for example. It was a very brief mention, and it was, uh, again, confirmed by the devs of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, who I managed to interview a while back, that yes, they still are active, there is perhaps much less of them, and they are very much not trusted. However, yes, they remain in Warhammer Fantasy canon. They weren't removed when Mordheim died. I imagine that we will get some new lore regarding Warhammer Fantasy roleplay soon enough, as usually they start providing little hints and so on, and once they get to specific areas, they tend to flesh out the lore of certain regions. Uh, this has happened through multiple supplements, so that's good. Honestly, it would be great to see the Sisters of Sigmar getting some new canon for the more recent timeline, especially since Warhammer the Old World is going to be more or less around the area of the fall of Mordheim or a little bit after actually. So the sisters would be active, the sisters would be practicing. And I would say it's not completely out of the question that the sisters of Sigmar could be seen as units in Warhammer the Old World as we know that the churches are going to be at a civil war. Maybe the church of Sigmar might see the sisters of Sigmar as an asset, more so a front line to go and do some damage but also put themselves at risk to maybe see themselves annihilated. It's kind of like putting two enemies against each other. Now before I leave you, something important in Warhammer Fantasy could have been changed forever if Mordheim itself would have not been discontinued. Because one of the devs prior to the fall of Mordheim had a few ideas and this was fleshed out in a fan supplement regarding Joanna Heldenhammer. Yes, a descendant of Sigmar himself. Obviously, this couldn't really be considered canon, but the ideas could still be in the GW vaults and could be once again reused in the future. You never know. It also depends on uh, previous and current relationships between the former devs. I'm not too sure how Games Workshop does that because we know that Games Workshop have pretty good relationships with former employees, but there is a little bit of fan-made lore and I do want to discuss it a little bit as it's kind of interesting, right? So it came to pass that the sisters of Sigma succeeded in the impossible and gathered so many shards of the weird stone wounding the bodies of Sigmar's realm that their quest was complete. For in the cataclysm that destroyed Mordheim, there was also seeds of salvation. As the dreaded Shadow Lord descended with the comet to bring the eternal night to the Empire, so came a ray of hope, a stream of light. The second tail of the comets fell upon the rock, the fortress convent of the Sisters of Sigmar. Within the crater left behind, they discovered a hideous horned demon, holding in its heart a glowing orb, which clearly caused it immense pain. Wisely choosing to bind the creature with the blessed chains of Gromril, the Sisters sought guidance from their god through their all-seeing augurs. Their prayers were answered, and as instructed by their augurs, the sisters set out to free the servant of Sigmar from the skies above. They were commanded to gather the shattered pieces of the comet, seal them deep beneath their temple in the vaults of redemption to stop its corrupting influence from empowering the demonic creature. After many months of most bitter struggles, and after losing dozens of Sisters of the Order in brutal street fights, one day the High Matriarch Bertha witnessed how the demonic 
form around the glowing light shattered with a wail of utter despair and impotent rage. And from it emerged their long-awaited saviour. Within, they found a child of unsurpassed beauty, a girl with unmistakable golden hair of the Umbarogans tribe, and blue eyes shining brighter than any star or gemstone, a laughter, a peal of silver bells that was like finest wine on a parched soul. She was of Sigma, and yet her own person too, both a girl of eight years and an emissary of her patron god. They named her Joanna Heldenhammer, for her lineage could not be doubted. Within hours of her awakening, the girl spoke to the sisters. Joanna told that she had been sent to find and crown the rightful emperor of men, not to rule herself. Sigma, the wise father of men, wanted his people to grow up independent, proud and strong, not relying on supernatural help. Sigma also knew that should he install an immortal, all-powerful ruler on the throne of the Empire, his people would in the end be no more free than under the rule of a tyrant. Despite the protest of the High Matriarch, Joanna insisted to start her search of the holy regalia of the true emperor immediately, for she sensed that at least one of those treasures was hidden somewhere within the ruins of Mordheim. So with a heavy heart, Bertha sent the most trusted of her servants to accompany Joanna to face the immense perils of the city of the damned. But that's not all. The Guardian. From her birth, Joanna had been accompanied everywhere by supernatural guardian, sent by Sigma to protect her until she grew to her full strength. Most people see the Guardian as a great bird of light carrying a mighty warhammer akin to the legendary Gal Maraz. Others claim that the Guardian is a lamb of purest white with eyes like blazing sun. While some see a fish with gleaming silver scales, a giant creature that swims through the air as if it was water. All agree that the Guardian moves with the swiftness of an eagle and allows no harm to come upon Joanna. So, what we got here, which was the whole Child of Light concept, I believe it was to celebrate 20 years of Mordheim, um, is that Joanna is some sort of daughter of Sigmar from the beyond, essentially. Sigmar himself is a god, after all, uh, elevated by the will of his people. And the Guardian seems like some sort of angelic demon, essentially, or an angel, if you want to call it that. But it's something that has been touched upon very lightly in the 40k universe, obviously with the Sisters of Battle and the uh, Space Marine chapter, the Legions of the Damned, which many people see as demons of the Emperor, considering that they don't actually live or breathe. They come into existence uh, to fight against chaos, and then they disappear again again, um, it could have changed a lot of things for future lore, considering that Joanna would have had to find the true emperor. I don't know. It's interesting, and I wanted to discuss it here, mostly because, yeah, you never know, right? Concepts like this could have been left in the Games Workshop vaults, and could be explored in the future. I do imagine that we will hear of Mordheim eventually, once again, but until then, yeah. It gives you a lot to think about. I wouldn't say that it's out of the question to see some sort of uh, being being birthed from a god. We know that the motherland, you know, the very nature of Kislev itself spawns the great ice bears. And there have been many people theorizing that the gods of lore might have had their own entities. So who's to say that Sigmar couldn't? But what do you guys think about the Sisters of Sigma? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and let's start a bit of a discussion. I'm really into covering some Mordheim lore right now. I'm trying to plan out to do my own table and so on. So, yeah, I'm really enjoying these types of videos. Hopefully you guys like it too. But with all that being said, have a great day, guys, and I'll see you all again very, very soon.